Hello, everybody. My name is DC. Welcome to the Death Rock podcast. This is episode number three. Uh, my special guest today is Professor Johnny. Professor Johnny is the editor of Iron Fist Zine, which is out of Columbia. And he's also the, the singer of a few different bands. We'll have him tell you about those. That's that music you heard coming in here. Uh, Agoraphobia, their song, uh, Death Wish. Uh, how are you doing today, Johnny? Hi, DZ. Just chilling here, you know, trying to relax. <laughs> it's very good to see you. So uh, tell me, uh, you're, uh, you've been doing a zine for a, a very long time, this Iron Fist zine. Uh, how long has it been? Well, let me tell you, Iron Fist is my third uh, editorial attempt in my life. My first editorial attempt was called Brutalizer Scene back in 89. It lasted for three years. Then I moved to the States, returned to Colombia, did another scene called Vomitardo Scene. That was for two issues. I took a long hiatus, long stop, until 2011, when we started doing the Iron Fist Scene that you know. So it's been, what, like 12, 13 years now? That is amazing when it comes to that sort of underground publication and uh, the dedication that you have toward it and the scene in general, whether it's the local or metal as a broad, a broad genre. Uh, you're from Colombia. Were you born and raised there? And if you were, where are you from? Yes, brother. I was born in Bogota City. Yeah, that's Colombia for those who are listening. Not Colombia, Colombia, South America. Back in 1972. Born and raised here, lived in Colombia in different capital cities, and also lived and worked in the US. And uh, you worked as as what you you're uh, you're a professional, aren't you? You're uh, uh, in linguistics linguistics uh, language, correct? That's right, brother. I have a, a BA foreign languages teaching. I also specialized in education and I have been a languages professor for oof, like 30 years or so. And I have also worked as a translator and interpreter. Yeah. And in here, in the case of, you know, metal music, I try to combine my job with my, my passion and my hobby, which is heavy metal. That's the idea. Well, the people that are in heavy metal, all of us are fans. We all understand, you know, the the love that we all have for it. And it, like I said, again, <clears throat> it's amazing the dedication that you've had for it for going on for this long of a time. Uh, in Colombia, what was it? What was it like growing up there? You live in the mountains right now. Uh, you want to tell me what it was like uh, getting to that point? Unless you were born and raised in the mountains, of course. But tell me what it's like living there. Well, I have to tell you, man, I mean, I, my life, I have lived in so many places, so many cities in Colombia. I was not born up in the mountains. I was born in Bogota City. Bogota City is a, is a capital city. It's a cosmopolitan city that, well, you can find 11 million people living there. It's crazy. It's chaotic. But I spent most of my childhood in the coastal cities of Colombia, up in the Atlantic coast, right? because of my parents' jobs, they had to be moving all the time. So, well, we went there. I spent my childhood in cities like uh, Rioja, Cartagena, Barranquilla, Santa Marta. We changed cities every one or every two years. I spent my youth, my teenage years in Bucaramanga city. That's where, where I studied, where I went to college. I worked a lot there. I started my bands there and I started working for the metal scene in Bucaramanga. I was probably, what, 16 or 17 years old when I started doing this. I had my first uh, band back in 19, oh shit, 87, 88. Ooh, highly yeah. influenced by Napalm Death. So it was a grindcore band. I used to play drums back then. Uh, as I said before, I spent most of my, uh, let's say, what, youth in Bucaramanga City. Then I moved to the States 
because I was awarded a scholarship by the United Nations to go to work in the USA. I returned to Colombia. I didn't stay in the US. Uh, what else? Uh, I moved from Bucaramanga City to Bogota, where my family was living. And uh, I lived there until 2013. Where did you live in uh, in the United States? In the U.S., I lived in Worcester, Massachusetts. Did you do anything toward uh, metal uh, in while you were there? I couldn't because I mean I was you know just focused on my on my job, right? But I did spend some time you know hanging out in the bars and stuff, but. When I was there, the metal scene in Worcester was was very little, very small. Uh, actually, I remember I I went to uh, to see Testament, Stuck Mojo, and Pantera. I got to see Pantera in Worcester, Massachusetts. Actually, I guess it was one one year before before the tragic incident, mm -hmm. right? And uh, uh, I do remember one year. After I returned to Colombia, they started doing the New England Metal Fest at the Palladium. I went to and the I was like, one. fuck, man, now I am in Colombia and they start doing these things. I don't know if this is still going on. Do you know? It is. It is. They stopped for a little while, maybe about maybe about three, four years tops. But <clears throat> they brought it back after the last couple of years. Uh, again, it's tailored toward hardcore, but I went to the first one and I was able to see some amazing bands that, you know, looking on it, and I didn't think about it then, but looking on it now, I'm just like, oh my God, I saw Immortal. Oh, oh man. Oh man, I saw Demu Borgir. I didn't care that then that I saw them, but I did. Wow. You know, things like, um, <laughs> you know, like Puya. <clears throat> when do you ever get to see Puya again from Puerto Rico? Yeah. Or, yeah. you know. Those guys uh, played in Bogota. Puya, they're, they kick ass, man. <laughs> yeah, they're a great band. But the, the, the thing is about going to see the festivals, but being in Worcester, I was going to ask you that after this, be like, man, they had these festivals there. Uh, going back to your time in Colombia, tell me about, uh, you know, you're a little kid. You're very little. What's your first uh, memory of music in general? Oof. Tons, tons, because, you know, uh, I guess music runs in my family. My sister is a singer. She's a, she's a musician, professional. Of course, in a different, uh, you know, avenue. But music has always been in my family. We have always been surrounded by musicians. Uh, unfortunately, Darren, I did not study music. I regret. I do regret. Because um, I would say it was very primitive. <laughs> but I do remember when I was a little kid, and because of all this traveling, right, that I mentioned before, uh, we were exposed to different sounds and different things. But, you know, it's Colombia and, you know, the most predominant kind of music here is tropical music, you know, salsa, all those things, right? And, uh, well, I am familiar with all those rhythms, you know, but then... Uh, when we moved to Bogota, Bogota is not a coastal city. Bogota is up in the mountains, actually, uh, 2,600 meters above sea level. And in Bogota, you can see tons of different musics and shit, you know? So Bogota was a big influence for me. When I was probably 12 or 13, I started uh, listening to metal. And what attracted me was, number one, the visuals, and number two, the sound, because the sound was different from all the sounds that you hear in Latin America, you know? And in the 80s, you know, metal was big, it was booming. And unfortunately, in Colombia, it was not, because metal, metal heads, anything related to metal, punk, grind, hardcore, anything here, has been stigmatized, you know? So... We had to be like the pariahs <laughs> of society. I actually had to leave my family due to the music when I was 15. That is, that is a shame uh, that you weren't able to, you know, focus more on it. But uh, to, to that extent, you did 
you know, push yourself into a different avenue with metal. It's not it. Some people, you know, just never get that opportunity. Some people try in bands and bands and continue to, you know, try over and over again. And, you know, you have a successful underground zine career that you have done, regardless of if, you know, however many eyes are on it, regardless, this is, you know, uh, something you love and something that makes you happy to do it. And that's the thing about metal. It totally makes you happy. And one of the things about it is, is that it's, it's universal, whether it's people from Europe or people from South America or people from the United States. It's one of the only kind of musical groups that are sort of like in, inclusive. We're all inclusive and we all protect each other. Sometimes, it, you know, sometimes it gets a little rough in the pit, but we protect each other as this group. And, you know, we do. Um, tell me, you like you, your, your music uh, that you put out now is very heavy. Where, where did you get the transition from? You know, I mean, we're around the same age. You, you said 89. That's when I graduated high school. Around that time, I discovered Metallica and Megadeth and, you know, some of the heavier sounds it took till I was in college a couple of years later. But tell me what the first heavy sounds that you heard were, who they were, and what drew you to that? All right. Uh, well, as I said before, I was 13, 14, and visually, uh, Iron Maiden attracted me <laughs> big time, big, big, big time. The sounds of Black Sabbath, especially uh, Deep Purple, my all-time favorite from, from that time, you know, that era. And also the punk sound, the punk sound especially, because of the speed of punk, as opposed to, you know, to the metal sound back then. And uh, I started out of nothing, you know. I, 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 I just loved the drumming, the tempo, the fast, the speed, all the thing. And the drums attracted me. Why? Because I saw the band's videos and stuff, and I was like, wow, the drummer is behind, always behind, number one. Number two, it's the biggest instrument on stage, so everybody sees them, right? And uh, when I, when I, I, I mean, like I saw the full package, I was like, man, the drummer is the heart of the band. I want to be the heart of my band. So I started, you know, uh, borrowing a drum kit from these guys in, in that city, Bucaramanga City. And I started playing out of nothing, you know what I mean? I didn't have a teacher or anything, just by hearing, like I learned languages. And uh, that's how, that's how. But I will tell you, those are the biggest uh, musical influences that I had, you know, Sabbath, Maiden, Purple. And in terms of punk, well, Pistols, The Exploited, damn it. Bad brains, <laughs> and okay. even so, uh, there was a band in the states that was not very popular. It was called Death. Okay, I, I'm familiar Amazing. with. Amazing. <laughs> when when did you get into even more heavier sounds into the death metal? What did you hear first, and why did you think Ooh. that death metal was you know the way to go? I I did the same thing. I have my own reasons, but um, how did how did it happen <laughs> for you? Well, in my case, man, it was, uh, I would say, death metal. I would say, man, I mean, Latin America is a, is an incubation laboratory for extreme sounds, let me tell you. This is not very popular out in the world. Why? Because our bands are very underrated. Let me tell you that in the mid-80s or early 80s in Colombia, in Medellin, Colombia, you know, it's funny, Medellin is famous for the drug cartels, but they don't know anything about this culture. So uh, there were there were many bands in Medellin. The, the extreme sound of Medellin that was called uh, ultra metal. You don't see this in one of those categories of subgenres of metal, right? And it was called ultra metal because of the primitive sound, right, that they had. And all these sounds were really, really, really extreme in nature. You can, I mean, I can tell you names of bands like Parabellum. Maybe you have heard of them. Uh, Blasphemia. Yeah. These bands from Medellin that created the, the platform for, for all of us who were young at the time. 
and it was totally extreme. And let me tell you guys something that uh, Colombia is a Catholic nation. So you are young, you hear these extreme sounds, you want to rebel against this religious imposition. Metal was perfect. So the lyrics, the sound and the image, right? Boom, came together as one. And it was really cool because it was uh, a good way to, to show and reflect uh, what we were feeling and the ideas that we identified with. So I'll tell you, man, that I made my, my transition into the heavier stuff in 88, 89, you know? with the Colombian bands, with the Brazilian bands, Sarcophago, Vulcano, man, they kick ass. And I heard this oof, long way before I heard American bands or European bands, you know? So that was my, my transition. And one of the bands that really, really, really influenced me was Napalm Death, I have to confess. I do love Napalm Death. They, uh, they, they were something that, there was a couple of things that I listened to, like Slayer's Rain and Blood and Napalm Deaths from Enslavement to Obliteration, where I heard it and I did not I did not like it at all at first. I did, did not like it. But after repeated listens, they became my favorite things to listen to. And I'm, I'm, I've been a Napalm Death fan ever since. I mean, but it's after, we're on like the same kind of path. My trajectory landed me in college radio. I was in my first college radio station and they had... Death's Leprosy, uh, the first the first Pestilence album, Unquestionable Presence. I don't think that's that. No, the first it was the first Pestilence album, and uh, there was another one that they had there too, but I forget which one it was. But between those two, I was like, "What?" Oh, Obituaries, uh, Slowly We Rot, and Whoa. I was like, "Wow!" Listen to these things, and I wound up they wound up uh, recorded on a couple of tapes for me, but. I didn't have as much exposure to that. I mean, we had, I was actually in the first grindcore death metal band that was in my local area in Pennsylvania. Ooh. So Interesting. being, you know, like when I was in high school, just about to graduate, I was listening to Slayer and going, uh, I don't like that, you know, until like about a couple of years later, I saw them in concert. Tell me, let's talk about your zine. Uh, what, what made you start the first incarnation of it? The first, uh, first part of it. Well, I don't know, man. I, I just wanted to write and I just wanted to, to like bridge a gap, like a cultural gap, you know, across nations. And uh, I am really stubborn because uh, I wanted to make a bilingual zine, right? So that the readers could learn and practice either Spanish or English. At the beginning, you know, it's Colombia. English is not big here. There were a lot of naysayers, you know, like, hey, Johnny, why the fuck are you doing this in English, man? We read Spanish. We don't read English. And I said, hey, <laughs> hello, you're listening to heavy metal, man. This is Anglo by origin, you know? So why, why don't you make an effort and try to learn something? So I insisted, I insisted. And well, at the beginning, I don't really recall which issue, where, which uh, installation number it is, but I made a transition from being 100% uh, in Spanish to balancing, you know, 50-50% English-Spanish content. And now, you know, that we are in up, we're going to, to celebrate our 50th issue in the winter season. Uh, we're going fully by fully in English. Why? Because we have extended to the U.S. Now we have distribution in the U.S. in five states. We have reached different corners of the world that I never imagined we were going to. So the magazine has been growing. It started as a newsletter format, you know. Uh, it began as uh, having different uh, people joining in. This is why now my crew has grown. At the beginning, I, I was with, working with Rodolfo Ramirez Gomez in Bucaramanga. He was in charge of the design and the printing. Then he left and I started working with Gabriel Alexis Laguado, who, is, who has been there. He's very loyal and he has been working with me since uh, issue number two. 
And let me tell you, many people have, you know, passed <laughs> through the Iron Fist crew, including one of my, my brothers, my brother, brother, Ruben, but now I'm not working with him. And now uh, the crew is uh, international. Uh, some kind of support for me, not only in the language, but also in the contributions to the magazine, because they have become columnists. You know, Mindy is a great designer, so she's helping me with designs. Uh, Andy is amazing. I got to know about Death Rock through Andy. You see? So it, it, it was a challenge, and it continues to be a, ch a challenge, right? Because we want to grow bigger, better, and better. I, I see you growing since I've, it's been maybe about a year or so since I've been connected with you, maybe a little longer, but uh, it was an amazing thing one day that, you know, you, you tagged me and you had that picture up and you did a review of the magazine, but you had the first issue. And I said, holy shit, how did he get a copy of the first issue all the way in Columbia? Honestly, but it, it was uh, our buddy, Andy, Andy's uh very, very proficient with, you know, getting these copies out to people, uh, as well as everybody else. I have yet to meet everybody else, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, what is uh, the best part about about doing your zine? Uh, you, you have so many different things that are, you know, so many different like columns and so many different like things that are inserted in there. I love your use of space. You get maximum amount of space and reading material out of what you do. But what's your favorite part about it? Do you do layout? Are you part of that too? Well, I got to tell you, man, I mean, the best part of it, well, it's, that's a hard question. <laughs> but I'll tell you, Dizzy, uh, the best part of it is that Iron Fist has given me the opportunity to talk to my uh, favorite musicians, favorite illustrators, favorite writers, columnists around the world. And thanks to the internet, right? I have been able to do it, you know? I, and I have been able to get a good response from these metal icons that I never thought I was going to reach or interview. And I am really proud of it because uh, English language has opened the door for me for it. So I will say that, yeah, that would be the biggest part. And uh, every time I, I try to do the, like the blueprints of the new magazines, right? I try to include something new, like a new section or, I mean, something that really identifies me or identifies Johnny Gomez is that I try to do the different things. I try to do something that no one else is doing. You will not find a publication like this in Colombia. Number one, that is free for distribution. And number two, that is in English. And number three, that is international, right? And we do it for free. We don't charge money for this. We're not looking for the money. And uh, we survive on the advertising space. Yeah, so... If you guys need advertising space, just contact us and we will give you some grim and we will help you. And let me tell you, up until now, and in, starting in 2011, right, this is going to be our 50th issue. That, that, is, is, a, a, that is a big challenge, man, and it requires a lot of effort. But this is our passion, you know, and we just do it. We just do it. We just do it. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's, it's a crazy thing to do a zine. Uh, I've been, I've been mocked for doing it. You know, why are you doing this? You're a dinosaur. What are you, what is this? 1985? You know, I think it's a lot cooler and there's a lot more to it. It takes less time. You could put out more issues. There are people out there that still cut and paste. They still do the old, you know, cut it out and paste it on a piece of paper. It's a really cool way of doing it you know, to do it that old school. Uh, what is your favorite issue of of uh, Iron Fist that you put out and why? Oh, man, you're, you're throwing difficult questions here, man. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> that, that, that's like asking, asking a father or a mother, who's your favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I only have one. <laughs> I'll tell you. You know what? I can tell you this. I don't have a favorite issue, but I do have two that I don't like and I hate. <laughs> okay, well, I'll take that. I can tell you about that. They don't make me very proud. And it was because the situation was out of my hands. And let me tell you, it was issue number 36. Issue number 36 was supposed to be out in 2021 for the 10th year anniversary. But I had a little confrontation with the designer and he abandoned the ship temporarily. So I had to rely on somebody else for the design and the result was shitty. So the celebration was not what I expected. That is one that I don't like. And the other one was issue number 38 that we could not uh, get printed because of the pandemics. You know, everything was closed, everybody in lockdown. Me living in the freaking mountains, Bogota is two hours from my place here, from my farm. So I'm not proud of that. But still, we delivered through a blog spot or something. But I am not a digital person. I am not a computer person. So this is why I am as stubborn as a mule. And I insist on the, on the old school printed format. But I will tell you, I am very, very proud. I am very happy for all the other issues that we have been able to put out. But if I have to give you an honest response to your question, I will tell you that the last issues, especially in the A, A4 format, they are uh, one of the biggest accomplishments that we have done. Why? Because you can tell from the bands that we have interviewing, we have been interviewing, sorry. You know, like uh, before, it used to be very, very underground bands, you know. But now I, I have been, I don't know, man, I've I, I just tried to, to contact those legendary bands, you know, and they have been very responsive to it. You know, like look at the last issue, number 48. I got, I got a very positive response from, from Ronnie, from uh, Nasty Savage. They lost a lot of, of instruments and stuff. So I encourage you to please make donations to them. Ronnie is a really nice person. For me, he's like the grandfather <laughs> of metal in Florida. And in the same issue, I also got to interview Paul Spe Speckman from Master. You know, and this yep. feedback that I am getting from these uh, legends uh, is really, really... Uh, amazing and, and enriching because i mean they are probably 10 years older than me i am 52 they are in their 60s or close to their 60s and that gap you know that 10 year gap i call it the experience gap and that coming from them is a lot of uh input for me as a you know let's say what as a musician and also as an editor because they know the old format. They are familiar with it. And you know that it is different there when you are an editor, man. And when you contact the, these millennial bands, they ask you, you know, they don't ask you for a copy of the magazine to show. They ask you for the digital file to share in Instagram or TikTok and all those things, you know? Mm. I mean, I am grateful for them, but this is not my avenue. But yeah, I'll tell you, man, the last issues, amazing, because I am interviewing people that I never thought of <laughs> and uh it's amazing it's amazing what's what is new in the new issues or do you have anything coming up you want to you know give someone well, a, i'll tell you uh, this that i got here this is the most recent one that we have i don't know if you can see it right this one uh was good because it came out with uh it had a we got look who's here <laughs> that rock <laughs> yeah baby i love your magazine i'm looking forward to the next issue brother it had it came with a poster with these guys you know it was free it was the first time that we did a this color poster that was issue 48 it came out um april may this year but yeah. the next one here I got my contents list. Okay. 
<laughs> Let me just read it for you guys out there. This will be our 49th issue. Gabriel is working on the design this week. So um, I guess this will be out in 15 or 20 days. This one uh, for reviews, we're having Malignant Tumor from Czech Republic. You may have heard of them. They have oh, a yeah. new album. Pulso from Colombia, Devasted from Colombia, Storm of Darkness, ne Nero Capra from Italy, Idly Lava from Hungary, Casket Robbery, a review by Andy Hamlet. Uh, Andy also did some graphic novel reviews this time. Uh, what else? I also have in the spotlight section, I have a review of a Colombian record label called Parasite Records. I also have a review of an illustrator from Indonesia called Tani Art. I love working with Indonesian illustrators. Highly recommended. Yes, I have too. Um, I have a review of Colombian bands taking over the world by the horns. Right now, there are many Colombian bands touring out in the world, which didn't happen 10 years ago. And for the interviews, this one is going to kick butt. Why? We have a lot of interviews in this issue. The main one was with Tony Portaro. Well, greetings to Tony and Whiplash, celebrating, you know, 40 years of existence. Hmm. That's a lot. Yes. <laughs> then we have one of my favorite uh, death metal bands from the U.S. That's Jungle Rat. We have Dave and Geoff. They kindly answered my, my interview uh, in audio. And Mindy helped me transcribe it for our readers. We also have uh, Maimed from the U.S. Uh, we also have your contribution to this issue. That's uh, Shibalba the Mexican-American band, amazing band. Uh, we got Imperaterium from Colombia, Speak Metal, some guys from Florida, Colombians living in Florida. I have this amazing guy, uh, sorry, band that I recommend you. It's called I See You, Swamp Tooth from Florida, uh, Voidrium from Florida, and Endurus from Florida. So you can, as you can see, there is a lot of content from Florida. Why? I am working with uh, FDMS, Florida Death Metal Scene, you know, with Necro, Megan, you know, Brett, all these guys there. And my idea is to give Florida some kind of platform in the magazine as a reward or as a retribution for their help with the distro in the state, you know? So that's what, what goes for, for the next issue. That, and it will be accompanied by... A lot of, uh, I have these stickers here, free stickers for you guys. And as you can see here, we got it. Stabby Hamlet, the FDMS Florida, that will be our Iron Fist. DG Metal, this is a website by Gabriel, my designer. He also has a website. And this is Tribulacion Productions, the most representative uh, record label of Colombia. I really recommend you guys, if you want to get a, a taste of Colombian metal, you contact Mauricio Sanchez from Tribulation Productions. So, oh, I almost forgot. This issue, Darren, I don't know if you can see this. Hold on here a minute. Let me get this guy. There you go. All right. This issue, I mean the 49th and... From then on, it will be accompanied by this certificate of authenticity that will be personally signed and crossed by our official distributors in Colombia and in the USA. So to make it like a more personal experience with the with our readers. So that's, that's really what we have. <laughs> that's really a neat thing. Uh, it's cool that you give out extra swag with the with the the zine sometimes uh you know i try to put a couple extra things into death rock it's a you know it's a matter of you know giving back you do you do a great job giving back there, there, that, now that you mention it one of my biggest dreams and i hope that i accomplish this with the magazine is to give out everything for free that would be the, the my ideal thing but we have to survive you know oh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, but but I mean I have ideas for the uh, for the next uh, generation of Iron Fist. Probably it will come up with a CD or a flexi vinyl. You remember the old magazines? 
that mm -hmm. used to come with these flexi vinyls yep. for free, uh, but they are expensive and the production is expensive. So they probably are. I will have to ask bands for contributions or donations, but uh, my, my, my dream is to, to, to give away the, these things. I know probably journalists, probably other people who are professionals in this, they will be saying like, why are you doing this? You know, <laughs> but man, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I, I, I can't explain that. I can't, you know, I mean, some people have told me, why don't you make a bigger magazine, better quality, color printing, blah, blah, blah. And you charge for it. I'm saying like, yeah, I may consider that, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not close to that option. But yes, many freebies will accompany. Absolutely. Is this something that you think about on a 24 seven basis, your zine? And do you work on multiple z issues at one time? Yes, sir. Like I'm, I'm telling you this, uh, these are the contents for 49th. We already have the contents for the 50th issue. We already have the blueprints. We are already working on, on the fundraising activities uh, to have it because why I want to make our 50th installment the best ever. I want to have it. I want to have, uh, you know, like full color cover, front page, you know, different things, uh, free CD. And I want to have a raffle. I'm, go I'm actually, I'm going to raffle 50 Frisbees uh, with the Iron Fist logo for 50 fortunate readers. Actually, the Frisbee could be for them or for their pets. I know that <laughs> metalheads have a lot of pets. So maybe they can play with Iron Fist, not only just read it, but, but also play with it. So we are working on different things at the same time. And yes, sir, this is 24-7 even in my nightmares. <laughs> uh, I, I feel you. I feel you there. Tell me, uh, now that we've gotten like sort of through this, uh, tell my listeners and viewers some, uh, some bands that they should check out right now from where you're at and uh, go ahead, what, what right. they, what, what it is about them. Whoa. Well, uh, as I said before, uh, the metal scene, the underground or the extreme uh, metal scene in Colombia has been, oof, really, really, what can I say? Very active since the early 80s. There are tons of festivals here. There are so many bands here, but I, right now, I recommend you, uh, oof, I will say, I don't have like a top, but names that come to my mind right now would be Osuari from Oriente Antioqueño. That's like Antioquia, Medellin, excellent death metal. They have put out two albums through Awakening Records from China. Amazing record label. They are really good guys. I would recommend to you Decaying Prophecy. Amazing. They are close friends of mine. One of my colleague friends, he's a teacher, Jose Verhel. He's the guitarist there. And uh, I also recommend to you, mm, I will say what, man? Masacre, that is like the legend from Colombia. I would recommend, uh, let's say what, not the classics. I had it. I believe that there are many young bands here making good music. Perpetual Warfare, which you probably saw in Allenton, Pennsylvania. I've seen them with twice. Paul Rosa, with Paul, mm -hmm. Did, have you? They are now in the States and it's funny. Wilson, the bass player and his uncle Camilo, they were my students in college. <laughs> That's awesome. I had to flunk Wilson. <laughs> I didn't get the chance to see them this time, but I saw them five years ago with uh, Azotador and uh, they were, uh, they were both really, really, really killer bands. Really energetic mm -hmm. show, man. You want to see a real thrash metal show? from Latin America with that Latino blood, mm -hmm. you got to see Violator from Brazil and you got to see Perpetual Warfare from Colombia. Man, highly recommended, right? Yes. Um, well, there are, there are so many bands, but usually what we do is in the Iron Fist uh, playlist sections, right? We write 10 names of bands 
or in our Made in Colombia section, I usually recommend bands from our country. Or I also have contributions from one of our friends from Japan. His name is Hajime Kanai. He lives in Osaka. I met him through Mikitoshi Matsuo. You may have heard of him, Rockstack Records. And uh, Hajime, he is learning Spanish and his Spanish is really good. And one day I was like, hey, dude, would you like to write some kind of review about Colombian dance? Because he really, really loves Colombian dance, especially speed heavy metal dance. And he sent me the reviews in Spanish. The language was good. The writing was good. So I said, why don't you join our crew? And he has been writing and recommending uh, Colombian dance. And it is really good because it comes from a from from the perspective of, of somebody in Japan. <laughs> you know, know it is not a Colombian yeah. recommending Colombians. It's somebody from, you know, abroad recommending the world what we are doing here. So I really, I really recommend our readers and our followers or the viewers here to to you know keep close eye to our playlists and our made in Colombia section, right? But yes. those bands that I mentioned, go for them. They're uh I learned maybe about 10 years ago about Colombian bands being uh, my band Chinga was on tour with Betrayer and those guys were a blast to be around and to learn about your culture. Uh, being from Pennsylvania, you know, it's not too, too many uh, chances to living in a mountain area where I'm at. So to be able to, you know, be around these guys a lot, for a, a good couple of weeks uh and they told me about about the scene and that i needed to check out columbia i needed to listen to some of the bands and as soon as i heard that perpetual warfare were coming uh five years ago i said yeah i'm going to see them i i've never heard them so and, and have you heard any other colombian bands apart from from betrayer and perpetual uh not as many as i would have hoped to that's why i was hoping you. for you to tell me some more of them Oh, let me tell you that uh, through Andy Hamlet, stubbyhamlet.com, you can get or you can buy Colombian bands that we have, you know, sent him for distribution there. He has been very supportive, you know. We started working with Andy back in 2021. And out of the blue, you know, this red hair guy writes to me and, hey, I'm interested in Colombian things. I'm interested in the magazine. I want to support. I want to buy some of your materials and like, wow, interesting. So we shipped it, he got it, and he has been, you know, spreading the Colombian metal uh, from his store. So don't forget, stabbinghomelit.com. You can get Colombian bands through him. So when you want to go, when you per se want to go see, go to see a concert, you said you were about two hours away uh, from, from your your nearest city to is that the closest place bogota is that where the closest place oh, the to closest capital city is bogota yeah that's the closest city to see a concert well no well there are there are intermediate sized cities you know in between the way like sipakira tunja or here chiquinquira but those concerts are usually in small bars, you know, small venues, right? But if yeah. I want to go and see international bands or like big open air festivals like Rock al Parque, which is coming in like two, in three weeks, November, the biggest in South America for free, three days of craziness, uh, I will have to go to Bogota, right? But I have to, to, to plan it. I have to schedule ahead of time because, you know, I got my... You know, animals here in the farm, so I have to find somebody and go there, return. I usually go and return same day, same night. And is it is it a safe journey for you to... Uh... It is absolutely safe. It is. I mean, uh, let me tell you, like, there are many, many things uh, outside of Colombia that people hear, you know, but it is a safe. I mean, Colombia... Colombia, yes, we do have problems. We do have insecurity problems as anybody else does, you know, but you got to be careful. You got to know your way. And uh, and um, Bogota, Bogota is a huge city, man. And uh, 
that you don't want to be out in Bogota like three, four in the morning, you know, hanging around. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's as the same as you wouldn't like to be in Hialeah, Miami, or in New York, or in Chicago, or in Detroit, right? Or in LA. Right. You don't want to be downtown LA, you know, in the middle of the night. I mean, that that's that that would be a stupid thing to do. But for me, it's a safe trip. It is not expensive, right? And uh, many people travel. Many people travel here, Colombians. I mean, we are we are passionate. We have this hot blood passion for music that we travel, even if we have to travel 10, 12 hours in a freaking bus to go and see a band. Man, we will do it. Look what Colombians did back in 2008 when Iron Maiden first came to Colombia. Man, we had to wait until 2007 or eight for Iron Maiden to come. Hmm. And it was so big that the Iron Maiden, you know, the, the, the managers or whoever it was, they decided to include this impact in the Flight 666 video. Yeah, You could see oh, thousands of Colombian fans sleeping outside the, the stadium one week before the show. Of one week. Jeez. One, one, I'm serious, man. One week. That's crazy. I mean, I don't think you see that in the States. I don't think. You know, well, I don't think the Wacken Festival fans in Germany are going to wait <laughs> that long to, to be there. But we had to because it was our passion, man. And, and the wait was so long that it was crazy. They made a lot of money. No wonder Iron Maiden keeps returning to Colombia. You know, they come here every time and they say, this is our goodbye, but then they return. Same as Megadeth <laughs> and Metallica. Yeah, it's a South America is a big, big area for them, all those bands. Oh, Latin America? Oof, huge, huge, man. I mean, I don't see Megadeth or Metallica, uh, you know, filling the stadiums in the United States. I don't see that. In order to pack a stadium in the States, I believe it has to be like a big ass festival with a tons of bands. But in right. Colombia, these international bands, let's say, well, the, you know, like the big four guys, you know, they come Iron Maiden, just Iron Maiden, and they will pack a stadium, man. Just Maiden. See? So this is a huge market for these, for this, you know, big enterprises that I can call them. Now, in the underground, it's a little different. In the case of American bands, you know, back in the 80s or in the 90s, right, we had to wait until 1997 to see Incantation, man. Incantation was the first extreme death metal band in Colombia. And I'm talking 1997. You see? So uh, these emerging markets are very attractive. But Colombia, particularly, was not due to the violence, due to the kidnapping of the guerrillas in the 80s and in the 90s. But now the door is open, man. And you can see, for example, Bogota. You can see a concert on Friday. You can see another on Saturday, another on, 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 on Sunday. And I'm talking international bands visiting, right? Usually in small venues. But the, um, the negative side is in the cost of the tickets, right? Yeah. Usually, if you want to see the big, big, big name bands, you have to pay a lot of money. I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And if you see smaller bands in smaller venues, still, it's, it's big money. Like, for example, in the States, you go to a small venue and you pay $10, $15, Right? I guess that's the average. Correct me if I am wrong. I think what what did, was it again? Fifteen to thirty, 10, probably. Fifteen dollars. Yeah. Small venue. A small you venue, know? yeah. Not more than twenty. All right. And how about big open air festivals? That could be in America. It could be anywhere from you know seventy bucks to thousands of dollars with all the meet and greets. And it's worth it. But here we have to consider the, the currency exchange. Let me tell you, $1 equals around 4,500 Colombian pesos. So you see, it is expensive. The cost of dollar in Colombia is very, very expensive, right? 
And uh, the average cost of these shows oof, in pesos is close to half a million pesos. So I'm talking $100, $120. That, for the Colombian pocket, as I call it, or the Colombian economy, is not so good, man, considering that the minimum salary in Colombia is 1,500,000 pesos, close to, let's say, what, like $400 a month. So if you're making $400 a month and you're going to be paying $100 for your ticket, how the heck are you going to survive? So this is why in Colombia, particularly, I don't know about the other countries in Latin America, but in Colombia, the establishment, the state, sponsors and finances the big opener festivals. But you know that when the state is in, corruption flourishes. Mm. But that's they, kind of like the, the picture. <laughs> they know where the money's coming in. Oh, at, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's crazy, but but we love it, man. I mean, Rock al Parque, the festival that I'm telling you, man. I mean, they they can you can see in Rock al Parque. I mean, ask Lee Harrison from Monstrosity. Ask him what has been the biggest concert Monstrosity ever played. He will tell you Rock al Parque Festival Bogota. When in the world can you see? 150,000 people for free. Where? Uh, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. I know. And I've seen. I've seen enough. Challenge. I've seen the videos yeah. and the pictures of of bands playing down there, and it's, it's amazing. Crazy, man. And I believe that many, many metal bands are dreaming of playing this festival because it is the opening door to colombia and, and not only colombia but latin america you see so the bookings are making good money <laughs> and they are bringing culture to the country metal culture to the country which is you guys have a have a ton of metal culture absolutely i uh was going through working on some things uh for this video uh, like, um, the, we have to have a thumbnail in the front and I was playing around with some things here. You are as a samurai, All right? I was a throw, throw your face in the AI or, you know, you live up in the mountains there. I thought you'd be close to polar bears, but I don't think so that it's not that cold up there. Is it? <laughs> well, Here's the here's the real thumbnail. That's the one. I put you all the way up on the top of the mountain. <laughs> so, yeah. yes, I. I'm glad you do. <laughs> up in the mountains, at the top of the mountain. Exactly. <laughs> I'd like to thank you so much for coming on the show, uh, very much, and uh, we'll do this again sometime because our our lives are like parallel we both do zines we were both around the same age we both played music uh you know a lot of things like that just just the way things parallel with life you know you don't know that there's someone across the across the world that you know you have something in common with and you know you just don't get the chance to speak to them this is the first time i'm talking to you and this is a great conversation i'd like to thank you very much uh tell everybody one more time how to uh get your magazine and how to get a hold of your music. All right. All right. Easy. Well, well, first I, I want to thank you for having me and having Iron Fist in your show. Actually, this is the first time I am interviewed. I used to be the interviewer. <laughs> now I'm the interviewee. <laughs> so thank you for the opportunity. And to those of you who are watching and listening, well, if you want to get a copy, a free copy of Iron Fist Zin, Please, if you are in the, in the United States. Just reach out to me, ironfistmagazine at gmail.com or
our motto is only ink is real, right? So I encourage you to, to contact us through this. Or if you are in Colombia, we have 20 cities in Colombia where Iron Fist is distributed. And I want to take uh, profit of this opportunity to thank all my distributors in Colombia. Muchas gracias a todos ustedes, mis paridos. Ustedes hacen que Iron Fist llegue a todo el mundo. All right. So as I said before, Darren, thank you. I really enjoyed this time to be interviewed. Interesting. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you for now. But viewers, stick around. I'm going to play uh, the Agoraphobia lyric video for Death Wish. And followed by, actually, I'm going to put it up on the YouTube page following this interview when it gets released. I'm going to put up your 10 years of ink, small little it's a, it's a uh, he goes through all of his issues. He just uh, scans through most of them, shows you the covers of them and stuff. And it's a it's a cool little like 10 minute video that gives you sort of a little history as far as you have right now. A few things. So we'll put that up on the station on the uh, YouTube page as well. Thank you once again for being here. Adios, my friend. We will talk soon. I promise. This is Hasta DC. La this is DC from Death Rock signing off.
your grace. Forgive me, Father. Forgive me, Lord. 